Hi, Gwyneth. How are you doing? My heart is racing a little bit because I take it as such a compliment that you are doing this podcast. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled. Thanks for having me. And my only encounter, I believe, with you was in the green room at the Golden Globes. (laughs) And you were just so kind to me. I remember you like looked me in the eye. We talked briefly. I vaguely remember you asking me how I was. And it's unusual, I think, for celebrities to ask questions. (laughs) Celebrities don't give a fuck about anyone but themselves. No. I was happy to meet you, and I've been a fan of yours. So it's nice to get some time with you over this medium. It's cool. Yeah. So can we dive into some life questions? Absolutely. All right. I want to cover like 80 things. (laughs) We'll start out a little bit easy. I wanted to ask you what the softest item in your closet was. Mm, Probably an elder statesman cashmere sweater that I bought in the fall. That's probably the most expensive sweater I've ever bought, embarrassingly. But it was so soft that I had to do it. Yes, I completely understand. (laughs) All right. We covered softest item. Gwyneth, have you learned anything about yourself in terms of quarantine? I think a lot. I've learned that I like puzzles and knitting, which was very surprising. I hear you. Have you picked up anything during this time? Or is the isolation bubble something that as a celebrity you're used to? It's a good question. I mean, I am naturally a homebody. And I think that's why it was like a part of being an actor that I really didn't love, you know, being away from home, being alone in a hotel room, ordering room service, being disconnected from my friends and family, even before I had kids and everything. I love being at home. So for me, I think this whole experience, the part of it that has kept me home, I have loved so much. Like I have loved being with my teenagers all day, every day, even though sometimes they drive me nuts. I love that cocooned sort of thing. But I feel a little bit like I didn't fully leverage this time. Like, you know how to knit now. Like, I didn't learn a new language. I just was like... What? No, you're building an empire. I don't know if puzzles (laughs) and knitting are really going to pay off. (laughs) Why don't you knit a cashmere sweater? Yeah, will you buy it? I'll buy it. (laughs) So here's a topic of conversation, and I sort of want to go deeper, if you don't mind. Do it. I want to talk about your relationship with fame. It must be such a huge part of your life. Have you ever felt anonymous? Golly, I mean, I've been in the public eye for so many years. The surreal part is having been famous basically my whole adult life. So I don't know what it means to be a grown up without all of the scrutiny and all of the wonderful things and terrible things that come with being a famous person. I think Our culture idealizes fame so much. And I actually think it's a pretty terrible thing to be famous. If our purpose on the planet is for human development and to really become the truest, best versions of ourselves, I think fame is a huge impediment to that. And I've had to work really hard to separate the fame from who I am. I mean, now at this point, it's okay. I mean, sometimes I still am like, oh, this is such a weird experience. But the level of projection that a famous person has around who they are and what people think of them, you know, for me anyway, I I had to really stop internalizing it. And actually, when I look back, you know, when I got famous, I was probably like 22 years old and, you know, I was starting out and you have a publicist and every day the publicist would this is way pre-internet, facts, you know, if you were in Us magazine, which was a monthly magazine at that point, Uh. or they would fax you, you know, oh, you're in the New York Times today. And literally six months into it, I said, I have to stop this. This is not healthy. This has nothing to do with me. I'm getting like excited if somebody writes something good. I'm getting depressed if somebody writes something bad. This is none of my business. And so I haven't really read anything about myself in a really, really long time. And I've tried to focus on cultivating who I actually am as a person, just while understanding I am in the public eye and there's a ton of opinions and projections and trying to not let that influence my relationship with myself. I knew you were going to give me an amazing and thoughtful answer. Gwyneth, I was listening to a podcast you were on. I think a wonderful quality about you is that you worked so hard growing up. Mm -hmm. You had a variety of jobs. I think you mentioned that you started working when you were 14. I was younger, yeah. 12, maybe? Yeah. And I love that about you. I think that that stupidly, it surprised me. 
I had the pleasure of working with your mom, whom I adore. Oh. I was embarrassed for myself that I made an assumption that your path, not that it wasn't difficult, but maybe it was a little more laid out. I really admire that you really worked. And I loved when you spoke about being a hostess and consumer care (laughs) and making sure that people felt heard and respected. It probably surprised you because there is an element about the surprise that makes sense, right? Like I grew up in a wealthy family and I went to private school and there definitely was an element of privilege in my upbringing. You know, sometimes we get so binary. So that means, oh, you've had everything laid out for you. But the truth is that it's more complex than that. My dad, who was a completely self-made man, was obsessive about my brother and I understanding that the wealth that we grew up in was his and not ours. And we were not entitled to any of it, nor would we ever be. And so he said, you can enjoy this while you're here and I love you and I'm going to share this with you while you live with me. But when you're done, you're done. Like, I'm not giving you a penny. I will never help you. And he stuck to it. So, you know, we had jobs after school. My brother worked at the deli on the corner. I worked at a toy store. I worked at a ski store. I worked summer jobs. I worked. He's like, if you want money, you have to work for the money. So I think what that did was really instill in me this work ethic But also at the same time, like, yeah, I was growing up in a beautiful, you know, townhouse in Manhattan. So it was a funny juxtaposition. It was a very valuable parenting lesson. Let's put it that way. And I remember when I quit college to try to be an actress, he was like, I fully support this. This is great, but I am not helping you. I mean, there were times where I was like, but I have no gas money to get to this audition. And he was like, that's not my problem. I love you, but that's not my problem. Wow. That's impressive. I always imagine that the time between being nominated and winning an award would be euphoric and lonely. What was your experience like winning an Oscar? I remember it was a very surreal time. I was doing a movie in Vancouver. My dad was directing and he was recovering from this crazy cancer surgery at the time. And I'm so glad that I was focusing on him. My whole family was there. My brother, my mom, we were just kind of like all banded together as a family to get my dad through this movie, which was really hard. And thank God I had that to focus on because it was the weirdest, most surreal time. And, you know, you're also kind of embarrassed that you're nominated for an Oscar and you have imposter syndrome and you think like, I can't even believe this is happening and I'm not even that good. And does everybody hate me? It's the most bizarre time. But then at the same time, in my case, I hadn't won yet. So I was kind of like, well, of course, I'm not going to win, but this is kind of cool, too. And also this feeling of goodwill from people. You know, obviously, if you're not in L.A., people don't even really know or care about the Oscars to the degree that we think they do. You know, in L.A., everybody was so supportive. And then I remember winning and feeling like, okay, this is the tide sort of turned and there was like this feeling of when you have that much attention on you and that much kind of energy It was really, really overwhelming. I remember I was staying with my parents at their house in Santa Monica, and I just kind of like hid for three weeks afterwards. It was so intense and I felt so lonely is the right word. It was really strange. I felt that way when I got Scary Movie. (laughs) (laughs) I can totally relate, Gwyneth. No, but it's the same. You have anything that you really want and like a gateway to other things and achievement. It's like, we all have those things that are on our vision board or in our head when we're 16. So it's crazy when they come true. It's absolutely crazy. Okay, what is a trait you dislike in others? At my grumpy old age, there are a lot. I love it. But if I have to pick one, (laughs) yeah, I mean, dishonesty. If someone's not honest, they're just wasting your time on every level. I feel always taken aback, especially in the business world when someone's dishonest. I don't think it's linked to my own naivete, but maybe it is. I don't know. Dishonesty is something that just baffles me. Yeah. A lot of people are not honest. It's wild. In order to be an honest person, you have to have a level of comfort with who you actually are. And I think a lot of people don't have that. So I feel sometimes real compassion for people who can't be honest, but I just don't want to be around them. Yeah. Okay. Would you consider yourself a romantic? I think I got boy crazy at like 10. I got that way later. I was a late bloomer. My defense mechanisms come out like around real intimacy and vulnerability. So that's what I've had to kind of work on in real life. And when you're in that crushy sort of teenage thing, like 
your fears around intimacy and vulnerability aren't part of the fantasy. So it's this pure feeling of romanticism and love. And then you go through life and you get the shit kicked out of you. And then, you know, you show up kind of less vulnerable and that feeling can be less accessible. But I think I'm a real romantic. It just takes a while to get all the way down there. I have diaries filled about this guy, Ryan Gervon. Guy. He was a child. (laughs) And he was the fastest runner Um, at my school. Wow. And I was the shortest kid. And it was just, I love Ryan Gervon. And my mom was like, I don't want you to be boy crazy. You're boy crazy. She really wanted me to make my own money, to be independent, to not rely on men. Probably to a fault, actually, I think. You can be boy crazy and also make your own money. And that's what you showed her, (laughs) by the way. Look at you. (laughs) What talent or ability would you most like to have? I would like to be a lot better at math. Oh, that's a good one. No one has ever given that answer. I'm so dumb with math and like, I really need it for my business. And it's so hard for me and I can get there eventually, but I'm just not good at it. It's just not the way my brain works. It was never my favorite subject. Going to therapy is just like a lot of things we already do. We get our cars tuned up to prevent bigger issues down the road. We go to the gym to maintain physical wellness. And we brush our teeth because we don't want them to fall out. Going to therapy is like all the above. It's routine maintenance for your mental and emotional wellness to prevent bigger issues down the road. Therapy doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It means you're investing in yourself to keep your mind healthy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Why invest in everything else and not your mind? This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and unqualified listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Ferris. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash F-A-R-I-S. Chris, hi! Are you at a point in life where you are feeling fulfilled more often than not with Goop? You know, not because of things that have happened to me or things that people could look at and be like, well, of course, you know, because you have X, Y, and Z, which is all true. And But I think the reason that I feel fulfilled is because I've worked really hard to find my integrity and to be brave in giving myself permission to go after those things that are harder or more embarrassing to get or feel scary. And so it's like, I'm going to be winding up my forties here in a few years. And I kind of gave myself a goal when I was around my 40th birthday to really try to be absolutely true to myself and to live that. And so that's what I've been kind of going for. And I do have to say the fulfillment that comes when you forgive yourself and you give yourself permission to really be who you are is pretty profound. I can only imagine that it must also be freeing. I wanted to ask you if your taste in partners has changed throughout the decades of your life, if you find this intriguing. (laughs) I do find it really intriguing, and I think it applies to everybody because, you know, the choices that you make when you are a less resolved, younger person really become about what you're trying to heal through a romantic relationship. And so we all have those aspects that we're trying to heal and we're young and we don't realize that we're just projecting a lot of stuff from our childhood onto a person and then hoping to change the outcome, you know, of our childhood by dating this guy or this woman. I feel like I really, for a long time, was choosing men and trying to work shit out with them that I had no business trying to do in a romantic relationship. It was work that I needed to do myself. I was really good at choosing men for a while there that I could make it all about them and, you know, not have to focus on my own problems. (laughs) I think that was such a generous thing for you to say. It's really true, though. It's really true. And 
it's like in a divorce, you know, I've learned so much from something that I wanted least in the world. Like I never would have wanted to get divorced. I never would have wanted to not be married to the father of my kids, theoretically. But I have learned more about myself through that process than I could have imagined. And because I focused on accountability, I was then able to find like the most amazing man and build something that I've never had before with Brad, my husband. What point in your relationship did you recognize that? Was that immediate with Brad? No, because we were friends first for a long time. And then once I was like, are we going to date? Is this like happening? I was scared because he is a person who demands presence and intimacy and communication in a way that I just didn't know how to like, I like to fight by shutting down. I'm like, goodbye. I like leave the room. (laughs) Yeah, I'm the same way. And he was like, no, he's like, absolutely not. Like we're sitting down and we're figuring this out. And he demands that I am honest with myself in a way that is hard for me, but which really helps me grow. So I think I recognized his amazing qualities, but until we were in a relationship and I was like, oh my God, it was like being with some kind of jujitsu master where they're like, no, I'm going to make you see your own stuff for you to be able to win in advance. You know what I mean? I do. I'm engaged to a man who's demanded the same thing, which I had never had before. I had never been confronted with like intense eye contact, actually. Oh, it's so awful, isn't it? (laughs) Well, I don't know. Sometimes it can be pretty hot. (laughs) No, I know. But just like, I'm the same, like avoidant and like, what? you know, don't reveal everything about me, you know? Yes, you're 100% right. I've been married twice. You've been married twice already, and this is going to be your third? Yeah. Nice. I like your style. (laughs) (laughs) But my two other marriages were with actors, and I don't think we did a great job of eliminating competitiveness, or at least I didn't, you know, being a proud person and not wanting to reveal vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Any hints of competitiveness and comparison, Mm -hmm. I didn't handle that very well, I don't think, and I hope I've grown from that. Okay, Gwyneth, when we are free to travel, where are you going first? Usually in June, we go to the UK and we visit the kids' family. And then we have some kind of little time somewhere in Europe or we'll take the train to France or something. And it's also been very cool to just be in America for a year. Yeah. It's been great. And obviously all the travel has been so reduced, which has been great. But I always think that you learn something about yourself by going into a country where you don't speak the language and where you're discovering all the time. And I miss that. I do miss that. I would like to get back to Europe, maybe this summer. Do you think? Yeah, that would be so nice. Yeah. All right. This is a question that I sometimes ask people what the relationship is with social media okay. because it fascinates me. But I'm worried that with you, it is complicated and also very business oriented. I'm bad at it. I'm not on Facebook. I think my team maybe puts me on Facebook, but I've never been on Facebook. I do Instagram, which is pretty easy to do. And I'm not on Twitter. So I would say it's limited. And I have a weird relationship with it. You know, it's like, obviously it's a point of influence. And I think people think it's important for you to have followers for work and stuff like that, which also seems weird. I don't know. I'm terrible at it. Like, I don't know what I'm doing on there. I know. I don't even want to waste time talking about it with you. (laughs) I would rather know what a trait you dislike in yourself is. Oh, I'm really impatient. That's the trait that I like least in myself. Like really impatient. Yeah. If I'm stressed out and then things aren't lining up quickly, it's not good. Okay. Who would you invite to your dream dinner party? Wouldn't it be great to have a dinner party with you and all of your exes? Like how fucking crazy would that be? And like challenging and embarrassing and funny. And like, what would you learn about yourself and them? That's what I would pick. That's amazing. (laughs) Like anybody, after a breakup, you want your former partner to be like, oh, you were the best things ever happened to me. I miss you. I need you in my life. What the fuck was I thinking? And whether or not you take them back is like irrelevant. Would that happen (laughs) at our dinner party? (laughs) Maybe. Should we do it? (laughs) I love this. I love this idea. Can you imagine? Oh, my God. That would be so funny and weird. 
Gwyneth, has a stranger ever changed your life? I think certainly in lots of little ways. I can't think of anything like, oh, you know, someone said this and, you know, it saved my life or something. But, you know, I've had these moments, like I remember once I was on a flight. I think I actually put this on Instagram because I was so touched. But this flight attendant gave me a note that said, like, I was once a daddy's girl too, or something it was like right after my dad died. Oh. And I felt so seen and like I felt that human nature can be so kind. And what a generous way to deliver that message. I know. It was so sweet. That sticks out to me. That's really beautiful. I love that lady wherever she is. <laughs> Gwyneth, you gave me the best vitamins I've ever had. Oh, good. Yes. And I continue to order them. And I really good. could use more goop in my life because I'm not the healthiest person. I'll send you a whole basket. You have no idea. That just gets me so excited. <laughs> Tell us about the things that you are really loving with Goop these days. I mean, I remember maybe like three years ago, you had this awesome like survivor <laughs> kit that I really wanted. I couldn't find it the other day. But what things are you really excited about with Goop? You know, I love what we make because I love women so much. And the point of the site is really to help women optimize their lives and give them tools to make great choices. I really really believe in non-toxic beauty. And so it's so amazing to be able to make products. And we have all these other great brands that are clean on the site as well. I love what's happening in the world of clean beauty. And I think it's really empowering for women to be able to make choices around looking better and doing whatever that is for them, you know, whether it's clean beauty, exercise, injectables, whatever it is that make them feel good. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about an injectable. I'll totally tell you about it. I had always been a person who was a little wary of injectables. Like I'm kind of a tomboy. I don't really wear a lot of makeup unless I'm, you know, talking to you. <laughs> and I found this thing called Xeomin, which is a purified version of an anti-wrinkle thing. So I tried that and it's been great. Like you don't need it yet. You're still a spring chicken. Well, first of all, there's a nice filtration thing happening here. <laughs> I like Botox, but I want to do whatever you're doing in life. <laughs> well, this one is nice because it doesn't doesn't have any like extra proteins or anything weird in it. It's a very natural looking one. So it's really the right one for me. But I always say like, whatever we need to do as women and mothers, as we age, like go for it. I support everybody and whatever it is. I love it. Gwyneth, will you tell us about your oldest friendship? Yes, of course. My oldest friendship is with a woman named Mary Wigmore. We met in kindergarten when, in those days, you started kindergarten when you were four turning five. Now we would have been a year back, but we were both four when we started. And she has been my best friend since then. It's more like we're sisters, you know, because we grew up in each other's homes and with each other's parents and siblings. And we've been with each other through everything. And she's like family to me. And it's one of the most cherished relationships of my life. I have a lot of really old friends, but she's the oldest. <laughs> I think that I always struggled with female friendships. I felt like there was a language that I didn't know how to speak in terms of trying to make friends with women. Mm. I think that I let jealousy get in the way, like consume me too much, mm. which is just such an awful feeling. That's interesting. So then I, maybe in my early 30s, my strategy for combating jealousy was to attempt to befriend anybody that I had those feelings towards because it is impossible, I think, to have any vitriol with somebody who you genuinely like. Well, I think that as women in our society, too, where a lot of us are taught that there's not enough pie for all of us and that if one woman has something, it means we're not getting it. And that's absolute bullshit. Like the world becomes so much more beautiful and fruitful when women succeed and when we support each other. It's a lesson that my mom taught me really early. I remember once it was between me and one other girl for this movie. I was like 19 or 20. I was just starting and I didn't get it. You know, the other girl got it. And I kind of badmouthed her and said, like, she's not even that good. And my mother was like, oh, no, 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 no. Don't you ever, ever say that about another woman. If you didn't get that part, then that just means it's not your part. It doesn't mean anything about you. And don't hold on to that. Like, your part's coming. And so it really flipped that competitive thing for me. And I just thought, yeah, that's true. It's obviously not my part if I didn't get the part. And I think it really goes along with one of my main philosophies in life, which is that life happens for you, not to you. 
So if life is happening for you and something happens that hurts or is hard, that's ultimately for a reason. And it's a good thing. Completely. Okay. Was there a book or a TV show or anything from your childhood that changed your outlook on life or something that was very formative? Oh, yeah. What popped into my head right away was a record called Free to Be You and Me, which was this record of stories and songs. And it was like this very progressive feminist album. I used to listen to that and be like, wow, you know, I can be anything I want. And women are as good as men. I was probably like eight or nine or something like that. It had a big impact on me. I remember that record. Okay, we have a second half to this podcast that focuses on relationships. Okay. Do you have any general advice or words of wisdom? Well, I'll tell you something that sounds kind of trite and sort of new agey, but is just the truest axiom. If you don't really, really love yourself, If you're walking around in the world thinking, I'm not good enough, and I'm not pretty enough, or I'm not this enough or that enough, you're never going to bring a full self to a relationship. Like, How could somebody love you as much as you love them if you don't love yourself? Yeah. And by the way, it's taken me 40 years to learn that. So your listeners are rad because they're contemplating this stuff at a much younger age. And the way to really start to love yourself is to forgive yourself. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Bathe yourself in like warm light of forgiveness. And then you'll start to get in touch with those things about yourself that are so unique and beautiful. I love you so much. Thank you. (laughs) I really do. I really do. I've been so looking forward to talking with you. Oh my gosh. Thank you. I'm so happy that I got to be on your podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being so fucking amazing. (laughs) Oh, no. All right. I hope someday our paths can cross. They will. Someday we'll be back in the Golden Globes waiting room together, and I'll give you a giant hug. I love that. Thank you, (laughs) Gwyneth, so much. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by Mosey Baby. Mosey Baby are makers of the Mosey Kit, a groundbreaking home insemination product that's safe, simple, affordable, and sexier than a fertility clinic. Of course, you can always wear your own nurse uniform. The Mosey Kit is clinically proven to be as effective as IUI for conception, but if you are familiar with IUI and IVF, you know that these procedures can cost tens of thousands of dollars. At only $89, each Mosey Kit includes a collection cup, educational instructions, and two Mosey syringes, the first and only syringes designed specifically for baby making. At only $89, each Mosey kit includes a collection cup, educational instructions, and two Mosey syringes, the first and only syringes designed specifically for baby making. They are as comfortable and familiar as using a tampon, work with fresh or frozen sperm, and ensure you make the most of each try. Mosey also has ovulation predictor kits and pregnancy tests, everything you need discreetly delivered to your door. Wondering whether Mosey is a good fit for you? Check out their instructional videos, educational articles, and real stories from the Mosey community and get inspired to start your journey. Mosey Baby has helped thousands of families inseminate safely, comfortably, and effectively at home with the Mosey Kit. Ready to make a baby? Visit moseybaby.com slash Anna to get 15% off your first Mosey Baby purchase. Again, that's M-O-S-I-E-B-A-B-Y dot com slash Anna to get 15% off your first Mosey Baby purchase. Hey, dear listeners, Rachel Hollis is back. Rachel is the best-selling author of Girl, Wash Your Face, Girl, Stop Apologizing, and her latest, I Did Not See That Coming. You can find out everything Rachel is doing at her website, MsRachelHollis.com. Hi, Rachel. Thanks again for joining us. Oh, my gosh. My pleasure. All right. Let's call Carla. Hi. Hey, how are you? I'm good. It's so nice to meet you. 
You too, Carla. Thanks for doing this. I am here with Rachel Hollis. She's the best-selling author of Girl, Wash Your Face and Girl, Stop Apologizing. And she's amazing. Awesome. Carla, tell us what's going on. Yeah, so I made a big cross-country move about five months ago and ended a three-year relationship at that time. Moved away from all my family and friends. So I just started online dating like a month ago. The first guy I met, we spent like probably 10 hours talking to each other over the course of two weeks and like really hit it off. And I was like, oh my gosh, you could actually meet someone online. This is so great. And then we got tested for COVID so we could get together and he made me supper at his house. It went great, I thought. And then he straight up ghosted me and didn't speak to me again after I went to his house for dinner. What? I don't fucking get this. So I've only ever dated my friends. I've only ever dated people that I already know really well and that know me really well. So they kind of like know what they're signing up for when they want to be in a relationship with me and vice versa. There's like tons of emotional safety for me and dating people that I already know. I'm 30 years old, but I don't feel like I've ever actually dated. The first time you went out on this thing, you thought it was great and then you got burned. Yeah. And it's like, screw that guy, whatever. I I started dating again. I have a second date tomorrow with a new guy. I'm just like so confused about how people actually date. This is probably like questions usually like a 20 year old would add when they just start dating. But I feel like I just started dating and I don't know like how much to reveal about myself when I don't want to lead with all of my whole history right off the bat, keep some of the less uh, enjoyable things about myself until a certain point but like at what point do I reveal how much of myself and how do you date someone that you don't even know like there's so much depth in dating my friends (laughs) I think this is right up Rachel's alley right okay so I'm gonna trip you out right now Carla I am 38 and I have never dated meaning I met my ex-husband when I was 18 years old so Literally never kissed a guy, never went on a date except the one single person who I married, which is wild. So now I find myself 38 years old. I am truly doing all of this for the very first time because you are not the first person who's like, I don't know how to date. I don't even know what to do. I don't think there are rules for dating. I think there are rules for being you. Like you have core values as a human being that you believe in, that you want to see, that you want to put out into the world. And I think that's how you navigate dating. Like you navigate it the same way you would navigate making a friend. Like these are the values that this person has to have, meaning like they're not a jerk. They're nice to the waiter. They make me laugh. They like the same stuff that I do. And I think that you pursue that. That guy ghosted you. Great. You just found out that you went over to dinner at some insecure unconfident like yeah because if he was confident he'd be like hey carla i had so much fun with you but it's just not the vibe that i'm looking for like that's what an actual grown-up does so yay you dodged a bullet but i think for me i want to show up as myself because i want to know as fast as possible if this is not the right thing i love that that doesn't mean that i sort of let all the crazy out the first time that i talk to someone but i'm not afraid to be myself. And I'm paying a lot of attention to how someone is responding. Did he think that thing was really funny too? Did he sort of have a similar belief around that? Because those are cues that I'm paying attention to, to find out if this is something that I need to try and keep pursuing. Totally. And actually, that's one thing that made me feel okay about this scenario. I felt like I didn't misrepresent myself at all. I want someone that really wants to date me, right? It's just like, well, how are people so nice? And then all of a sudden they're, they're immature and can't handle, you know, like I've had to let people down since I started online dating and it's not fun to be on either side of that, but it's so much easier to just be like, Hey, it was great to meet you, but you're not for me and I'm not for you. So let's keep, keep it moving. Carla, like if I were in your shoes with that one situation, it would feel like a tick under my skin to not get like any kind of explanation or closure or anything on that. Then the other thing I have is I have been comparing other people as I've continued to go on first dates, not necessarily compared the person to this guy, but compared how I felt, right? Because I did feel like a pretty strong connection to this guy and attracted to him and all the things you want to feel when you start dating. So how much value should I give that comparison? 
Carla, if I could take that last experience and erase it, you know, I'm 44 and working on like the comparison ideas that I still have, whether it's friends, career, siblings, uh, you know, all of that stuff. Just know, Carla, as you get older, those feelings tend to really dissipate, which is great. There could be a gazillion explanations that you may never know with this guy. I wish I could prevent you from comparing that experience to anything else that you'll have in the future. Is it worth like keeping that feeling though? You've been trying to look for that feeling again and comparing like how I feel about new people? Well, I always fall hard, fast. I think that's how I'm built. I mean, who doesn't love those feelings of being in love? That's what we're all kind of looking for. So I want you to have those feelings, Carla, and, and but I just want somebody to protect them and have them with you. You know, what I thought of when Anna was talking was this old quote that says, comparison is the death of joy. That the second that we start comparing ourselves to someone else's relationship, life, job, that we rob all of the joy and the abundance in our own life. And I think that this also shows up in relationships, that when you compare this new person to that guy that you had dinner with one time, you robbed this new opportunity of ever being anything. You know, like, I don't feel the way that I felt when I was having that experience, but it feels like you're not giving the new person the chance to like be whatever it's going to be. You got to look for that spark because that's what this is all about. Like it's that connection. It's that butterflies in your stomach, whatever, but not looking for that guy or girl who gave you that spark. And hopefully the people you're going out on dates with can suppress those ideas too if they're fearful about getting into a relationship because they had a similar experience. I've been trying to work on really uh, attempting to be present and dedicate at least 70 to 80% of my thinking brain to the person that's in front of me and absorbing who they are. You know, and it's always difficult to do that when there's something else that's tugging at your brain. And I'm really sorry that this thing happened to you because I do think it was impactful as it would be for anybody, especially because you're new to online dating. So to have your emotions invested that much early on, that is hard. It all feels like learning as well. Like it's just part of the my new quote unquote journey of I'm doing like a big career change and moved away from all my friends and is like how you date people you don't know who, you know, have no comeuppance if they don't. I don't know. I don't know how to do that without the emotional safety of friends. How are you approaching that, Rachel? If you're kind of in the same boat. Yeah, I know this is so much harder in side of a pandemic, but for what it's worth, what I keep thinking for you is like the same advice I give. I have a lot of women in my community who are like, how do I make friends? Like I'm an adult and how do I make friends? It's hard to make great female friendships as an adult. And what I always suggest that they do is find a common hobby. I know this sounds like something I would tell my eight-year-old, but we, all of us have like the thing that we're super into, like really nerdy. And I don't care who you are, what you look like, what your age is. If you're into the thing I'm into, we can be buddies. And I think that so often that's where relationships start. I think that like, okay, you're not attracted to that guy, but then maybe he has a friend. Like you said, you're used to dating people who are your friends, right? So they know what to expect and like you can vibe with them before it's ever something that's more formal. So what if you sort of lead out on that? Like in my dating profile right now, I have images of like the kind of thing that I would also want this person to be into. So there's no surprise. If you like want to go eat kale and, you know, do a CrossFit class, I am not the girl for you. I'm like eating a burger and drinking scotch. So like you are going to vibe with me right off the bat and know what I'm about. And I think it's the same for you. It's like lead out with who you are and find your people. Totally. The other thing I've started doing is I've given up the, I don't know, for a long time I had a thing that you have when you're young where it's like, I don't want to ask people to set me up or like tell people I want to be in a relationship because like makes me feel vulnerable or whatever. But I've given that up and I have made some good friends here already. Put the word out like, hey, if you know anyone you think I would click with. Carla, I love that mindset. 
I hope it doesn't sound patronizing that I feel proud of you. Like at 30, I think that's really wise to be like, yeah. Why does that feel so hard to do though? I guess because we are so scared of being heartbroken, of being hurt, of being less than because it can feel painful. But I was thinking about this the other day, like how if something embarrassing happens to me, like a few years ago, I was walking around downtown Seattle and I was wearing this sweater dress and it was, I didn't realize that it was tucked into my nylons. I was wearing nylons weirdly <laughs> in the back. So my ass was showing. I was probably walking around for about 20 minutes with my ass just hanging out, having not felt it. I was pretty mortified, but I found relief with confession. As soon as I unloaded sort of my experiences, my truth, I felt more embraced. I was a really proud person, probably till I was like 34, in a detrimental way. I think it kept me really closed off to people. But I think that approach of telling friends and family, putting things out there in the universe, as we say, of like, this is what I would like and I'm fun, I'm beautiful. If you know people who are as rad as I am, send them my way. In this instance, I think about, you said the universe, and it made me think like, in terms of manifesting, I don't think that we attract what we want. I think we attract what we are. How you show up in the world and the vibration that you put out into the world around you is what brings people into your life. And so I think this is two things. One, you have to make sure that you are vibrating at your highest level. Like, how are you taking care of yourself? How are you leveling up? How are you loving yourself well? Doing all of this stuff because that is creating the energy that you want surrounding you. And then also, if someone's going to come into my life, whether it's a friend or, you know, someone that I want to date, I know exactly what I want. And I don't say like, oh, I like want them to look a certain way or be a certain age, but I know the personality traits and the qualities that I want in a person because I don't want there to be any confusion for myself about what would be acceptable here. Because I just think that the more specific that you get with your intention and what you put out there, it like blows my mind how stuff shows up. Yeah, I think the idea of making a list. Yeah. Because that's concrete and I can, you know. You don't have to show that to anybody. That can just be for you. I really believe in writing goals as if they have already happened. Like without question is why I have the success I have in my life. I've done this for a decade. I do this in my business, my career, as how I want to show up as a mom or a friend. And I write the things that I want as a like, this is a thing. So I would say, and I have this in my journal right now, Carla, like I am so happy and grateful that I found a partner who, da, 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 like, I just wrote it out like a paragraph and sort of described it like a scene because I think it's important to visualize what it is you're wanting to create in the world. And that way, you know, when it shows up in front of you, because I do think that it can really get muddled. And it, I think, Anna, you said you tend to fall hard and fast because I'm like, oh, my, we're going to be best friends. And it, no, you just. They were in line at Starbucks. Calm down. That's not how this works. <laughs> so it's really easy to start acting from a place of emotion instead of like being thoughtful about it. So I think that the better we are setting ourselves up for what we want to attract, the more easily we're going to see it. And the more easily we're going to know, yep, that guy is actually not the person you want. He's just hot and your emotions are running away with you right now. And that same inclination also made me forgive things that hurt my feelings without being vocal about it. You know, plans get dropped because a buddy's in town or like the little things that I wish I was in a mental place where I could have said, hey, that hurt my feelings. I just want to let you know. And here's why. But I was too proud. I wanted the love so much. I just ignored a lot of my hurt feelings in an attempt to like... <laughs> Yeah, people please so that you can get the love that you're hoping for. Yeah. Yeah. Carla, I love that as you talk about, you know, putting stuff out in the world and being honest, I love the idea of clocking some of those things. It's so easy to want to get people the benefit of the doubt as well. Like, obviously, I want to find love and have love, but I also find it so easy to put myself in another person's shoes and be like, well, they could be acting this way for all these 12 different reasons. And they're probably still a good person. And but see, that's emotion. That's not your brain. That's your heart. 
And I do think that you have to keep coming back to like, okay, let me think through this in the right way and not color this because I'm a writer. Like that's my job. I can imagine anything. I can make up whole scenarios and 50 different ways that this can play out. And because I'm a romantic, I can absolutely let myself go into a place where I'm like, oh no, this is what it, no, no, no. Just look at exactly what is happening in front of you, not the thing that you're imagining in your head. I think one of the skill sets that I have coming into this new world of dating and considering partners is how much I have done to learn personality types, Enneagram, love language, like you talked about avoidance, like that is such a game changer because I'm meeting people and going, oh, I know exactly what's going down right here. And I know how our personalities are going to butt heads over this thing. And so I can sort of cut that off at the past. Like, yeah, this is probably never going to work because you and I are both this same personality type and we're going to end up competing with each other. And that is not something that I'm trying to create. So this is a good opportunity for you, Carla, to dig into that self-awareness and what's going on in you because it'll help you when you're navigating a relationship with someone else. Totally. And one thing I've tried to get better at is allowing for the benefit of the doubt to exist, but also asking for what I need. So like whatever the reason you're acting that way is, regardless of that, I still need these three things from you and I need to be treated this way no matter what you got going on in your life this is this is my baseline of how I how I deserve to be respected sometimes it's easier said than done but I want to try to think about that as well Carla what's so cool though about what I'm hearing from you I mean you've moved to a new place you don't have any of like your security blankets and it sounds like you know more about yourself than maybe ever before which is incredibly impressive. I've definitely had a lot of time with myself. (laughs) (laughs) Haven't we all? (laughs) I've done some of the personality stuff. I'm in a psych class. I don't know. It's fun to be 30 and realize how much I've learned about myself over the last 15 years of being a pseudo adult and realize how much I've grown up and matured and how much I do know myself and know what I want. Getting old is kind of fun. I know 30 isn't old, but I'm like excited to keep learning about myself as I keep getting older. Okay, so Carla, as you move forward, I want you to look at that guy that you had the date with as this. You auditioned for a TV show, and they called you back, and they called you back, and you got in front of network, and then you didn't get the job. (laughs) But you know what? You just got to audition again because you have to pay your mortgage. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay, here's another way to look at it. Your rejection is God's protection. Like there is something that's meant for you, that's meant to be, you don't know what or why. I'm sure as an actress, Anna, you have experienced things where you're like, this is my part. Like I have to get this part. I was made for this part. And then it doesn't work. And can you ever find this sort of serendipity and like, oh, well, if that happened, I never would have gotten this thing I was actually meant for. I mean, I always get emotionally invested in anything, no matter how shitty the project. (laughs) 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 But the roles that have felt like Cinderella's shoe, I've gotten. So maybe there's an appropriate comparison with a relationship, too. It is a fit. It really, truly goes both ways. And that kind of helps soften the sting of rejection the other times because it probably is about me, but. (laughs) But then good riddance, right? Like if it's it's not a good match, then regardless of how I feel about the situation, like anyone that wants to take themselves out of the running should do that. 100%. Someone who's like upset with me could come up the line, right? (laughs) Carla, did we give you some hope for the future? Some like food for thought. Although it sounded like we didn't need to. It sounded like you are a pretty optimistic person. Yeah, for sure. No, it's just helpful to hear someone else affirm my take on this situation because I feel like I kind of exist in a vacuum right now. (laughs) Like I'm living by myself with my dog. So just like being able to speak to y'all about what's going on and get some insight on how the fuck you even date in a pandemic, let alone like date for the first time when you're 30. Rachel, I'm glad to hear that you and I are in a similar-ish situation, and I have full faith that you'll make it work. And no matter what, I'm going to have fun. I so feel you, though, on the social rustiness. (laughs) We've been in this weird thing for a year where now we're sort of getting used to talking and seeing ourselves back with all these, like, Zoom meetings. 
<laughs> so Carla, I can't thank you enough though. Your story is interesting. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, I'm gonna make a list and try to manifest some shit. Yes, yes, <laughs> do that. Do that for me. Cool. Thanks for taking the time, y'all. Thank you so much for being so open and for talking with us. For sure. All right, bye, Carla. Bye. All right, bye-bye. Rachel, thank you again. This was fantastic. You're amazing. I'm glad it could be helpful. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, Rachel. Bye. Bye.